In the Gospel of Luke, God is on a quest to seek out and to save the lost. And so Jesus comes as saviour to enact this salvation. We see many ways that we can perceive who Jesus is in Luke's Gospel. But this is the one I want to focus on at the moment. The Gospel records salvation history where God is the preeminent figure whose movements are consistently moving toward those in need. The captive, the blind, the lame, the poor, the oppressed. And in this quest, there are human opponents, but the biggest opponent is Satan. So I just want to talk to us for a little minute about this idea that Luke understands that the world, there is a battle between good and evil. There's been remarks that Satan is referred to only a few times in Luke Acts, although far more than in Matthew or in Mark, more similar to John. If they're small in quantity, they are mammoth in significance. We can see this in five ways. Firstly, God is the one in control of salvation history and not Satan. And so we get lots of language of fulfillment right from the prologue through to the Emmaus Road. What God has said will happen, does happen. That's a good thing for us to remember in 2021 as life is really uh, quite difficult, I know, for so many in churches. Zechariah proclaims that God has raised up a mighty saviour and indeed we find that the salvation uh, that, that Jesus brings is immense. Secondly, Luke understands that historical figures move on a divine timetable. So Luke anchors his gospel in temporal history. So we hear of the time of Herod when Jesus is born. We hear that Augustus is the emperor. We hear later that in the ministry of Jesus, it's in the time of Tiberius, and we get the various rulers in Palestine in chapter 3. Luke is concerned to anchor this story into the history of the time. But what we find is that God is stronger than any of these historical figures. And so in Luke 2, when Augustus issues the decree that all must go to be registered for the census, what we find is Mary and Joseph, of course, having to move from Nazareth um, down to Bethlehem. And what we find is that Luke couches this story all in this language of Micah 5. In actual fact, what happens is God had decreed in the 8th century through the prophet Micah that this messianic shepherd who was going to bring peace to the ends of the earth was going to come from Bethlehem, just this small place of Bethlehem. And so we, we see even divine figures are moving on God's timetable. Thirdly, we see that the true opponent of God is Satan. I think this is helpful for us to remember. Look, I'm a pastor's wife. I know life in churches can be hard. But our true opponent are not those problematic people in our churches. It's Satan. And there are many references to Satan in the gospel. We get them in the wilderness temptations like we do in Matthew and that little snippet in Mark. Luke writes though that Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit and he again doesn't just use this language of spirit but of Holy Spirit because he's demarcating God's Spirit as good, holy, other, okay, divine as opposed to these other 
uh, spirits like the devil or the unclean spirits that we see. And so what we're getting, even in this part, is a confrontation between Satan and the spirit. And this confrontation affects physical, governmental, and earthly realms. Remember when the 70 or the 72 in chapter 10 come home from mission and they're just overwhelmed with what God is doing. Jesus says to the disciples, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And there's this dimension that where the gospel goes forth, uh, Satan's realm is being um, cast back. Now, there's a lot more I could say here. Maybe I'll say a few things. Um, remember the story of the bent over woman in chapter 13. Now, there's a play on words going on here because, of course, they are indignant that Jesus heals this woman. He notices her in the synagogue. Okay, women were there in synagogues. And they weren't separated. It wasn't until the Middle Ages where the Jews separated out men and women. So you can just imagine, much like today, although they sat um, a lot around the edges and things happened in the centre, um, families sitting together. And she comes in and Jesus casts out the spirit. And of course, there's Sabbath and there's this, you know, confrontation because he's done it on the Sabbath and he says you untie your oxes because they were allowed legally to go and untie an ox if it needed feeding or it needed water or if it fallen into a pit but they didn't allow him and he said Satan has kept her tied up we often read bound but it's the same language of untying the donkey for 18 long years and Jesus is setting her free. Now, this is not a one-to-one -one thing. It's not like we see this in all the healing stories, but there's that dimension that sees that ultimately there's some connection between the fracturedness of humanity and the infirmity in bodies. And so Satan, who's God's opponent, kept her shackled uh, while Jesus sets her free. I just love that. We notice in the parable of the sower in chapter 8 that Satan is the one who snatches away the word of God from people's hearts. And so they might not believe and be saved. So he is the opponent in this forward movement of God to save his people. It is Satan who enters Judas in chapter 22 and then he goes to work with the chief priests and the officers of the temple. Now, notably in Luke's gospel, there are no Pharisees in his story of the passion story. He's certainly lessening the human component. He doesn't let humanity away, but he goes for the utter echelon of the leaders, the chief priests, um, particularly. And it is them um, who are complicit in Jesus' death. But And so when... They come and they enter the garden. It is Judas who's leading them. Now, that's unique to Luke. And of course, um, who has entered Judas? Satan. So it's Satan who is um, who is the key antagonist in the story. Then we find that Satan will go on to demand that all of the disciples, there's a plural there with the disciples, are sifted like wheat. Don't we feel like that sometimes as pastors and pastors' wives and leaders within the church? There is a spiritual struggle going on. Anyway, enough said about that. Luke, this is how Luke understood the world. The other thing, number four, is that there's more mention of angels and demons in Luke's gospel than in any other gospel. And needless to say, this is just some of the supporting material that talks about this um, concern of Luke's, that there's this cosmic battle going on. He also uses the language of dunamis, of power, of exousia, which is authority, and pneuma, language of spirit, um, distinctly and predominantly in his gospel and as he does this you see the struggle that is going on um, within the gospel 
which is going to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. And of course, it's going to Jew, it's going to Gentile. It's going to the crippled, the lame, the poor and the blind. You know, in Qumran, they believed it was the righteous, the pure and the perfect, something like that. Might be the intelligent. Uh, they were the ones that were going to sit at the Messianic banquet. No, Luke pushes back so strongly on this idea. God's mission is going to the weakest. Okay, it's going to everybody. And this could be something that challenges us with what God is saying to us, with where we're putting our time and our energy. Um, we find so many people that are broken that come to Jesus. Um, especially the poor and we do see the rich as well remember we see the women in Luke 8 and they're sharing their resources they are on the road with Jesus okay we're seeing all kinds of people and even we're seeing the rich Zacchaeus who enters the kingdom of God and of course then there's this economic reform that is going on anyway that is a taster for you about the cosmic nature of Luke's gospel I'm currently trying to edit a manuscript, a book on Luke's gospel. And this is just one little section that I've been working on about the cosmic nature. Anyway, my prayer is for you and your ministry. Um, I'm praying now for pastors, for leaders, for eldership. I'm praying for spouses and I'm praying for families because I know um, this is a tough journey. So I hope that there's some fuel for your journey. And of course, you're always welcome. I'm teaching the Gospel of Luke this semester on a Monday morning. Um, you can join us on site or you can join us by distance. And also I'm teaching a course with Michael Rhodes, uh, a master's paper on kingdom economics, where we're looking at the whole economic reform that goes on. We're going to be engaging uh, with an economist to learn about money markets and things that are happening and we're going to be talking to courageous leaders who are um, using money effectively for the kingdom.